GLA Q&A here, 2014. Uh, I have some questions from some of my fans, some of the people that couldn't make it to the seminar. that had a few questions they want me to answer about mixing or, or audio or whatever. And we're going to run through those right now. My first question comes from Jesse Miller. And his question is, what was your most recent mixing aha light bulb moment did it fit into your current workflow or was it a one-time usage event? Well, Jesse, that's a tough question. Not really tough, but it's an interesting question. What you're saying, did I have an aha light bulb moment? I get those all the time. Like, I'm surrounded by light bulbs. I'm like Thomas Edison. Um, when I work with projects, there's always that, oh my God, what was I thinking light bulb thing. Um, I was just mixing Stevie Nicks's album and, you know, the most important thing is paying attention to the rough and getting the rough, you know, getting what you're doing to be a continuation of what they're used to. But in her case, an artist like that wants you to create something different. So from doing her records, I realized that she wants to go through everything and take it all apart. So matching the rough was only the beginning. The aha light bulb moment was be ready for anything. So, you know, the light bulb can pop up at any time. The thing is, is never fall into a pattern. Always be ready to accommodate the artist. So, Jesse, aha light bulb means be ready for anything. Now, our next question comes from Patrick Karen C. Hello, Chris. I've listened a lot to your mixes, and I love the way your vocals sound. What is your typical vocal chain when it comes to mix? Well, Patrick, yes, the vocals to me are the very important thing. My typical vocal chain is to kind of actually use my plugins. Um, I came up with plugins so, so you have a go to setting. So there's two ways you can go. My vocal plugin in my signature series is the best start point for you. If you're working in Pro Tools, go right to the signature plugin, and right there you have six faders to give you EQ, compression, reverb, and delay. That would be my go-to startup point for anyone who wants to get a vocal sound that's like me. So Pat, good question. I invented that plugin just to answer this question. So give it a try, CLA Signature Plugin. All right, Pat, good question. The next question comes from Tom. He's got a, a long question here. I'm gonna read it to you from the screen. You've said many times you try to do a mix in one pass. How do you still make sure you get the first impression of the song after you've solved all the problems, such as annoying frequencies, etc., and still be able to work from your instinct? And do you ever get to a point where you've lost the connection to the song during the mixing? How do you then go back without losing your own excitement about the song so you continue and go forward? Thank you so much for your time. Well, that's Tom S.'s question. Basically what he's saying, I like to do the mix in one pass, how can you stay fresh on it? How do you solve all the problems and stay fresh on it? That is the ultimate challenge. I look at the clock as your enemy with mixing. And being fresh in a song, it's got like a, a freshness state like milk or cheese or yogurt. Um, the most important thing is to try to have your assistant team or someone helping you do the prep work so when you come in dealing with it, a lot of the basic problems have been solved. So what your next problem is is balancing and solving inner balances in the song and EQing not being an audio maid. If you're going to sit there and be an audio maid, have to tune things, correct timing, get rid of leakage, it's going to give you too much time with the song. So the key is, is to do as much prep work without listening to the song as possible. And I think that's the secret, is to try to do the prep work beforehand. Tom, good question. The next question comes from Szilard Bolros. Hey Chris, thank you for helping us to understand your mixing philosophy. You really deserve a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, thanks for that. I hope the Grammy guys think of that at some point. I have two questions. First, please talk about your philosophy on how you hear drums and how you approach them technically. Second part to his question. In your mixes, every instrument, vocals, etc., have a great separation and clarity because at the same time, it's glued together and so punchy. Can you talk about what your main framework, technical approach to achieve that? And again, he says, thank you for your time. Here, the first question is, the philosophy is, look, being a drummer, I hear drums a certain way. I hear them in your face. I hear them have a certain impact. Now, every song is different. 
Some songs I want Led Zeppelin, some songs I want Chic. Some I want Affected, some I want Tight. It's kind of based on the song. So the second part of your question is, how do I get all that separation? I think the magic to getting a separation is keep it simple and monitor at a quiet level. If you monitor quiet, then you can really hear the separation. The louder you turn it up, the more it just muddles together and the more you don't hear the separation. So listen quietly and keep it simple. When I mean keep it simple, don't start right away with compressor, compressor, compressor. Start with nothing. Start with just the balance, then season to taste. Good question there in two parts, so I hope I answered that for you. The next question comes from Kozmin Strout. He says, Hi Chris, knowing you are mainly using the LCR panning method, how do you deal with the 6 dB drop in volume that the sides suffer from when listening to in mono? Well, I think it's 3 dB. I think it's 3, not 6. Since people rarely sit in the sweet spot, too many of the song might sound closer to the mono version. So with LCR, what is your advice on making the mono version similar to the original and not let the kick snare bass vocal dominate the whole mix? Well, that's a tricky question. Not tricky, but here's my take on mono. I don't care about mono. And I have other words I can use about what I think about mono, but right now I'm just going to say I don't care about mono. Here's what I care about. People that listen in the middle, people that listen in stereo. If you're sitting off to the side of the speakers, it's not my fault the mix doesn't sound right. You're making the mix for people that listen in stereo, okay? So that's the focus. Listening in mono could be a stereo speaker situation that's just off in the corner where the separation isn't that wide. So what do I do about the 6 dB drop or 3 dB drop? I don't worry about it. I worry about stereo. I worry about what it sounds like in a laptop, what it sounds like wide. If I have to go mono, I mean, it's not really a consideration. This is 2014. This is not 1959 when we worried about mono. So anyway, I wouldn't worry about it. I would focus on the most important thing is, how does it sound to you sitting in the middle? So a good question. Hope I answered it for you. The next question comes from Philip Roder. Philip's question is, Chris, I love the drum sound on the Rise Again stuff you did. Could you please elaborate on how you make today's very static and awful sample-supported drums feel natural and big at the same time? Well, that's a good question, and here's why you're such a big fan of Rise Against. A lot of these bands take a lot of time and effort in getting a good drum sound. The key to me is if you want good drums, you have to build them in. You have to put the time and effort. That's why you like it. Those drum sounds are very good, and I don't really use any samples with Rise Against. Now, yeah, what do I do about other situations? It's tough. The rule of thumb here is use as much as the live drums as possible and only use the samples as a seasoning. The more samples you use against the live drums for rock thing, the harder it is to balance the drums. So the key is do your best to use as much as the live as possible. If you're doing more pop and more hip hop music, it's the opposite. It's all samples and that's part of the sound. So recording, and balancing. Philip, I hope, hope that answered your question. And the next question comes from Dan Weston. Dan's question is, if there were to be a film about you, do you think Nicolas Cage would be a suitable actor to play the lead? Now, Dan, that's a funny question. You're not the first person that thinks that I look like Nicolas Cage. And I think that's a huge compliment. I think that's funny that you're asking me a question that doesn't have to do with drums or vocals. Thank God. But you know what? I totally think Nicolas Cage is the guy to look like me. He may not be able to say, how you doing, like me, but I'm sure I can help. Dan, good question. The next question comes from Ben Turner. Hey, Chris, you make great use of pitch and chorus type effects. Can you go into detail about some of your favorite uses for them and any tricks we could be missing. Ah, oh, yes, tricks we could be missing. I love the tricks. Now, the coursing thing and the pitch things, it's tricky, I will tell you, because this is not the 80s anymore. So, coursing the guitars like we did back in the Dokken era aren't, isn't really working. So, we really have to hide it. The big time I use pitch and coursing is to widen keyboards, to widen background vocals, to widen, widen delays. That's the big thing. I don't want to hear obvious chorusing. 
but I don't want to just have stuff up the, up the middle. So I will use a delay with a very slight course to make something wide. So that's one of the secrets. So the secret here or the trick here is make it so you don't hear the chorus obviously. And if you do, make an effect. Live with it. You know, own up to the effect. And put, you know, if it's going to be a guitar, a phase guitar, go for it. So yeah, pitch effects here in 2014, very much about subtlety, widening without being obvious. So Ben, hope that answers your question. And I have Paul K. Paul's got a question for me today. His is, how loud do you deliver your mixes? RMS to mastering, and how do you get them loud without sounding pumping and over compressed, but still in your face? Another question is, do you blend real drums with samples? Ah, yes. Well, let's go to question number one. I will tell you the secret there, and the secret for you is that the lower you listen to your monitors, the easier it is to get your mix loud because you're balancing inside a very small window. Um, and it's not all about tons and tons of compression. You know what? It's all about balancing, using your ears, listening quiet, and pushing these things together. Um, and that's the secret. And how I deliver mixes? I deliver them at a moderate level, right at, right at zero. I don't, deliver a max, I don't deliver them maxed out to the roof because that would be fair to a mastering engineer. So usually a mastering engineer is going to get the mix 8 to 9 dB louder than mine. So I just literally have it 3 dB, 3 dB below normalizing. So if you just normalize your mix and don't do anything else but more normalize it, my mix is usually 3 dB below that, maybe 2, so there's some room to breathe. Second question is, do I blend real samples with real drums? Of course. I never only use samples unless it's really just a sample song, something that's basically samples only. So hope that answered your questions, Paul. Peter's got a, a question for Chris here. Contrary to popular belief, you actually don't compress the drums all that much. You are extremely good at deciding exactly when to compress a sound and when to leave it alone. A lot of people will compress the room tracks on every mix, but you don't do that at all. There's more to it. Wow. My first question is, this is what Peter says, when do you decide to compress the overheads or the rooms and why? Is it to get more ambience out of the tracks? Is it to tame the snare transients? Second, if the drums are not where you want them to be, would you first try and compress the overheads or would you rather first try compressing the room tracks? Let's say the overhead room tracks were giving you plain Jane. Well, you know, Peter, I guess you got me worked out, though. You got me all figured out. Um, you know, to answer all the questions, it's really simple. Um, your question is, if it all comes really plain Jane, will I compress the overheads or will I compress the room first? That's funny. I'll probably compress the overheads first, just to bring the cymbal energy up, just to see if that helps. I'll probably leave the rooms alone. I'll only compress the rooms if they're really boring and I need some life out of it. Because as soon as I compress them, it takes this excitement, it takes the transient energy away. So I try to do the least amount of drum compressing as possible and try to let the bus compressor do all that work. But yeah, I'll start with the overheads and then I'll go to the room. You know, sometimes the song really wants it to pump and I'll go all the way with it and that's the only way to get life out of the drums. But Peter, good question. So yeah, Plain Jane is a great place to start. So one step at a time, overheads, rooms, and it's all about bounce. So Peter, hope I answered your question. Ah, thank you, Sue. So, uh, so that's our Q&A from CLA here at La Fabrique 2014. Hope I answered all your questions. Um, I appreciate you guys making an effort to send me stuff to uh, talk about. So um, till next time, this is CLA from Mix LA over here at La Fabrique 2014 doing my Q&A. Later. Later.